In this video, we're going to go over the basic concepts of probability, which is a lot of definitions and just kind of establishing the language we're going to talk about. Definitely go through the PowerPoint and the rest of the resources posted in the 4.1 section on Blackboard to get a full clip, full picture of what's going on here, but I want to hit some of the highlights and talk through some of the concepts together with this video. So probability is calculating the chance, you can think of it that way, that um, something's going to happen. So we say an event is what could happen. What are the different things that could happen when we look at a situation? A simple event is one single thing in and of itself. Um, if we have a non-simple event, it means there's multiple ways it could happen. Um, so for instance, let's think about rolling a six-sided die. A six-sided die has the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six on it. So a simple event might be the probability of rolling a two. Well, there's one out of six ways of rolling a two. So that would be a probability of one six. Um, a non-simple event might be rolling an even number. Well, to get an even number, you could roll a two, a four, or a six. So there's three different ways to do it. So it's not simple. And the probability of rolling an even number would be the three ways to do it out of the six total possibilities, so three six. And often when you're doing probability problems, it's really helpful to write out the sample space for an event, which is writing out every possible simple event that could happen. So if we're thinking about the die, the sample space would be listing out the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six. It's everything that could happen, and that's a really good first start if you don't know where to go. So when we're calculating probabilities, all of your answers will be between zero and one, which is kind of nice. If you get a negative number or something bigger than one, you know there's a mistake in there somewhere. If the probability is equal to zero, it means it's impossible. If the probability is at one, that means it's guaranteed to happen. And then if we're in the middle at 0.5, that means there's a 50-50 chance it could go either way. And the closer you are to zero, the less likely the event is to occur. And then the closer you are to one, the more likely the event is to occur. So we have a couple different ways of calculating probability. Um, and these first two are kind of the same. The difference is where do we get the data? So one type of probability is experimental probability or relative frequency probability. And that's when we look at data and we calculate the relative frequency, or you could think of the percent of the time something happened. So for instance, if the probability of dying in a plane crash is one in 11 million, the probability of dying would be one over 11 million. Or the probability of being struck by lightning in the US would be one over 700,000. It says all adults in the U.S. have a 50% chance of being impacted by the Equifax data breach. Well, then the probability would be 0.5. There's a 50-50 chance either you were or you weren't. So the way we do these relative frequency or experimental probabilities is you just take the number of ways that something happened divided by the total, and that tells you the probability of that event happening. So another example, let's say a company is conducting an online survey of randomly selected individuals to determine if traffic congestion is a problem in their area. So far, 320 people have responded to the survey. What is the probability that the next person that responds says that traffic congestion is a serious problem? Well, looking at the chart, we have 123 people that said it was serious out of the 320 people surveyed. So the probability someone thinks traffic is a serious problem would be 123 divided by 320. Our next type of probability is called classical probability. And this is a lot of the kind of preset textbook examples where we already know everything that could happen and everything is equally likely to occur. So examples of classical probability is like rolling a die. You have six options on the die. Every number has an equal chance of showing up. And we've already talked about this one, but we could say the probability of rolling an even number is 0.5 because there's three ways for it to show up. The numbers two, four, and six out of the six total numbers on the die. So three out of six gives us the probability of 0.5. If we had a raffle where there were 2,000 tickets sold and you bought one ticket, every ticket has an equal chance of winning the raffle. So the probability of winning would be your one ticket out of the 2,000 total tickets sold. And then if you're playing a card game with a standard deck of cards, there are four aces in the deck and there are four kings in the deck. So the probability of drawing an ace or a king would be those eight cards that are aces or kings out of the 52 total cards in the deck. So the math is really the same way. You look at the number of ways the event can happen divided by the total. 
It's the same logic that we used in the empirical approach previously. The only difference is empirical probability came from real life data, whereas classical probability comes from some preset scenario where everything is equally likely to happen. So if we're looking at rolling a die, the probability of rolling a three would be one out of six. There's one three out of the six total sides on a die. The probability of rolling a seven would be zero. You can't do it. You can roll the die all day long, but it's only going to give you the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six. It will never show a seven. So that probability is zero. And then the probability of rolling a number less than five, well, the numbers that are less than five on a die are the numbers one, two, three, and four. So we've got four ways out of the six. So the probability of rolling a number less than five is four sixths. And remember we said the sample space was listing out all possibilities. So in this case, the sample space would be listing out the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six, because that's everything that can happen when you roll a die. So we said earlier that writing out the sample space is often a really good first step. Sometimes we do encounter problems that have a gigantic sample space, and sometimes you don't necessarily need to write out every possibility, but it is important to know how many possibilities there are. And that's where the fundamental counting principle comes in. It says if we're doing something and the first event has m total possibilities, m different outcomes, and then the second one has n different outcomes, then the total number of possibilities between the two is m times n. So for example, if you roll a die and then toss a coin, when you roll a die, you have six different possibilities. When you toss a coin, you have two. So the total number of combinations would be six times two, which is 12. If you list it out, rolling a one, getting a head, rolling a one, getting a tail, rolling a two, getting a head, rolling a two, getting a tail, and so on, you'd come up with 12 different unique combinations. If you're looking at a combination lock with four digits, well, the digits are the numbers zero through nine, so there's 10 digits. So you would have 10 options for the first number, 10 options for the second, 10 options for the third, and then 10 options for the fourth. So you would have 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 different combinations on a four number lock. If a computer password needs six letters and then one number, we wanna know how many passwords are possible. Well, it says six letters either case. So if you're counting uppercase and lowercase letters as different things, then for each of the first six possibilities, you have either uh, 26 lowercase numbers plus the 26 uppercase numbers. So that would be a total of um, 52 total. And then so it'd be 52 times 52 times 52 times 52 for the first six numbers, for the first six spots. And then one number, we said we have 10 digits. So you'd have to do 52 six times and then 10 for the last one. It's a lot of combinations. And then if we're looking at ordering a pizza, if you can have a small, medium, or large pizza, a crispy or hand-tossed crust, and then there are 15 different toppings, how many different pizzas can you get if you're just getting one topping? Well, you'd have three choices for the size times two choices for the crust times 15 choices for the topping. So it would be whatever three times two times 15 is equal to. So our last type of probability is subjective probability, and this is when someone makes an educated guess. Like if a doctor tells you that he thinks you have a 90% chance of recovery, that doesn't necessarily mean the doctor thinks that nine out of 10 people recover. He's probably just trying to convey that he thinks you'll be fine, even though you can never guarantee that medically. So we don't do a whole lot with subjective probability in this class because it really is just personal guesses. So our last main idea in this first section is the idea of a complement. And a complement is everything that's not included in the event itself. So these are two types of numbers that if you put them together, they make up the whole space. So for example, looking at a die, if our event is rolling an even number, the complement would be rolling an odd. Everything's either an even number or an odd number, and those two events make up the whole space. Evens and odds together make up all the numbers on a die. And what's cool is that if you take the probability of the event and then add the probability of the complement together, they always sum to one, representing 100% of the possibilities. So we use this because sometimes finding a probability directly is a little tricky, but if we kind of go around the back door and use the complement, it's easier. 
So we can say the probability of an event is equal to one minus the probability of a, the complement. And often this will make problems a lot easier. And so three keywords I look for that sometimes indicate you might want to try to use a complement are um, greater than, less than, or not equal to. And often with those type problems that show up, um, Complements will make it easier and we'll have some of those show up in the practice problem. So if it's talking about things being greater than or less than, like at most, at least, or not, those are all clues that you might want to try to use the complement. So for example, in a recent year, there were 3 million skydiving jumps and 21 of them resulted in deaths. Find the probability of not dying when making a skydiving jump. Well, we know the probability of dying is 12 or 21 out of the 3 million. So everyone else lived. So if we do 3 million minus 21, we get 2,999,979 survivors. So the probability of not dying would be the 2,999,979 survivors out of the 3 million total skydivers, which gives us a very large number close to one, meaning if you go skydiving, there is a good probability you will not die.